Lecture 2, Review of Computer Architecture. Although a regular program, like a word processor, need not be concerned with the underlying hardware of the computer, this is just kind of an abstraction, and the abstraction does not come for free. The operating system must be uh, aware of the details and manage them for everyone. But okay, what is a program? Well, a program is quite simply instructions and some data. Right? We are telling the computer what to do, and we are saying here is the data that we're going to operate on. Um, so, on the left, instructions, yelling instructions, uh, and on the right, data. Okay, but realistically, right, to like execute a program, we need a few things, right? We need main memory, this is a place where the instructions and the data are stored. Uh, we need a bus. The system bus is the way for uh, instructions and data to travel between memory and the processor. Uh, and then the processor is, well, that critical element of the system that actually executes the instructions that are provided to it. Um, and of course, this is a minimal set. Um, for any useful situation, uh, you will have a computer that has input and output. Um, and um, if you have a system that has no input or output, um, let's say it is at best limited in, in its usefulness. But to execute a program, at a minimum, you need these three things. So we'll talk about each of them just briefly. Um, okay, so main memory, right? Ideally, memory would be fast enough that the processor never has to wait for it, large enough to hold all the data of the system and you know, inexpensive. Readers familiar with uh, reality will recognize this as the Iron Triangle, fast, good, cheap, pick two. But the good news is we don't have to make only one choice, uh, right? We can have different levels of memory in our system, and those different levels can be at different sizes, different speed, and different cost. Uh, and we can say, all right, we're willing to have you know a lot of money spent on you know a smaller amount of very fast memory. Uh, we're not willing to invest as much memory in, say, uh, uh, permanent storage, in which case, well, yeah, that's cheaper because it's slower, but it's larger. So we'll, we'll get something. We'll get something that works. Um, and let's compare just briefly some of the various levels that we might have in our laptop. All figures just example and rounded and stuff, so maybe let's not you know, read too much into them. Um, but just to give you an idea of the scale uh, of what we're talking about, here's some numbers. So if we're reading data and data is in a register, uh, it's as close to the CPU as it can be, well, then you know, our access time for it is like one nanosecond, but this is very uh, limited. We can probably have you know less than one kilobyte, less than 1,000 bytes of memory uh, that uh, fits in registers. Uh, we can have cache. Um, cache is you know, on the same uh, physical chip as the CPU. Um, and um, access time in here is on the realm of two nanoseconds. Um, and our total capacity might be, say, 16 megabytes, which is significant, but it's not everything. You know, we would definitely want to have more memory than that in our system total. Um, then going to main memory, so RAM, um, access time, something like 10 nanoseconds. Uh, and the total capacity might be uh, 32 or, or 64 gigabytes, as far as we're concerned, uh, which again is, is much bigger, um, but it's not quite big enough for everything we would want, right? Um, for our system to really work, we need probably more than that amount of memory. Uh, and for that, we have, say, our solid state drive. Uh, and the solid state drive um, might have access times like 250 microseconds. Um, but you know, a total capacity of 1,000 gigabytes, so definitely a much bigger um, storage. Uh, and then potentially we have a backup hard drive. Um, in this case, I mean like a physical magnetic hard drive uh, where the access times are 10 milliseconds, but uh, our uh, total capacity is much larger, you know, several terabytes. Um, you know, I have some eight terabyte hard drives. Uh, at home, these are uh, used for mass and permanent storage of data, um, much more than you could realistically fit on solid state drives, or, or at the very least, not at the prices that I'm willing to pay, could you fit it on a solid state drive? It is noteworthy, um, just to look at the subject of cache, um, that cache is itself broken down into different levels. Um, so there's level one, level two, level three cache. Uh, in any case, whatever we do, the trend is clear. Um, fast memory is expensive, and as we get further away from the CPU, access gets slower, but it gets less expensive, so we could have more of it. Um, 
to give you kind of an idea so the difference in time that we're talking about here um, imagine I'm the CPU and a particular book is a piece of data that it's that is needed if the data is in the cache it is as if the book is on a bookshelf in my office thus I can retrieve it fairly quickly I just stand up I grab it uh, and then I have it in my hand problem solved if the data uh, for the CPU is on a magnetic hard drive it's as if I have to get the book from Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa. It's about 550 kilometers away, at least according to Google Maps uh, from the University of Waterloo. Um, and I would have to walk. The analogy is a little bit tortured because the CPU doesn't go get the data. What actually happens is a request is issued and then you know, when the request uh, is issued then um, it's going to result in the data being delivered to me. Um, so it's more like someone is going to walk it over. Um, but Okay, we can do with that. But what would I do in the meantime, though, right? It's it's going to be a long wait. Um, you know, while somebody you know very slowly walks this this over, what should I do? Well, I mean the answer is really anything. You know, uh, we should find something to do in the meantime. I should try to do a task that does not require the book that I'm waiting for. Hopefully, there's something else that's ready at the moment, which would make it a lot easier hopefully, um, for me to just pick it up and get started. And ideally, I don't waste any time. Life isn't always so nice. There is a possibility that I will be left sort of waiting for something to do. Um, but if all goes well, then no, I'm not left waiting for anything. And I'm easily able to just get started with something else. Okay. Um, super briefly, we're going to talk about the system bus. Um, Every sort of communication that we're talking about uses the same bus. Um, it is the main bus of the system. Uh, and this naturally results in a lot of contention over the bus. Uh, that is to say, there are different processes and different things that want to use the bus at the same time. Uh, and sometimes we're going to have to wait our turn for you know, our opportunity to use the bus for whatever task we're trying to do right now. That's not nice, but it's okay. Um, so the original IBM PC did have potentially multiple buses, um, and, but typically it was one. Um, however, yeah, I mean, in, in real life, you know, a modern system has numerous buses that work at different speeds um, for um, different functionality. So yeah, treating it as all, as all one bus is a simplification um, and not entirely correct but it's not so ridiculously you know, inaccurate that um, it makes no sense to talk about. So yeah, try not to get too caught up in the details. Uh, and then there is the CPU, the central processing unit, uh, the brain of the computer. Um, and uh, if you take a CPU design course, you'll learn, of course, it's more complicated than this. And you know, in future courses, um, maybe we'll talk about it. But at a, at a very simple level, you could think of fetch, decode, and execute as the basic steps that are taken. Okay, but why those three, right? Simple explanation, we fetch instructions first. This is, we need to go get the instructions, so find out what the next thing to do is, so fetch it. Decode, figure out what we are supposed to do. Um, so recognize that this is an add instruction or a subtract or a multiply or um, a load or a store. Uh, and then actually carrying out the instruction takes time. Now, um, this fetch, decode, execute cycle um, continues until the program finishes. If the program finishes at all, it is entirely, uh, entirely possible that your program just runs indefinitely. Um, and that's fine. Um, the fetch, decode, execute cycle continues, um, and we could do these steps in parallel, right? While we're executing an instruction, we could be decoding the one that follows it and fetching the one that follows that recognizing that sometimes um, the instruction when we evaluate it says actually we need to um, go back right uh, we reached a loop instruction uh, and when we execute it it means we need to go back um, that can happen uh, and if that does happen then it might mean that the instruction that we fetched is not the right one and we have to go back and do it again uh, but if we we're trying to do these steps at least partly in parallel um, then this is referred to as pipelining because uh, we have a pipeline. The length and the complexity of the pipeline is something we're not going to talk about here. Um, we'll actually touch on that much later on uh, in the course, but nevertheless, uh, right, the idea, uh, just keep it in your mind that we would potentially work on doing more than one thing at a time. 
Um, and processors, uh, you might have heard them described as 64-bit you know, processors or 32-bit processors. That's about uh, the word size. Uh, and that is the processor's largest unit, if you will, largest in terms of like what is the size of a type that it can operate on. Um, and uh, a 32-bit computer implies a 32-bit word, a 64-bit computer implies a 64-bit word, but marketing can kind of mess this up. Uh, if you're familiar with the Nintendo 64 uh, that was released in the 1990s, uh, or at least if you've heard of it, it was not a 64-bit machine. Uh, it had two 32-bit processors, but 64, I guess, sounded better uh, than 32 when it came to marketing, so it was the Nintendo 64. Uh, and accordingly, it got uh, the 64 added on to a number of the games that were released on the console. So, yeah, um, sometimes marketing wins and you end up with things that are not quite named correctly. That's one of them. But typically, you know, the size of the processor is what determines um, the size of the word. Okay. Um, so CPU instructions are specific to the processor. Uh, if you have any experience in writing assembly code, um, you might have seen the books or PDFs um, that tell you the instructions that can be issued and what operands, if any, the instructions take. Uh, and in some CPU architectures, some operations are available only in supervisor mode and not in user mode. Um, an instruction that say disables interrupts is an example of an instruction that's only in supervisor mode. And if we try to run it in user mode, then it's an error. Uh, the instruction is not carried out and we get some sort of error state just as we would if we tried to do a division by zero. Uh, we would end up with you know, some error state that results from it. Okay, let's, you know, let's talk about that in more detail a little later on. So CPUs can also have storage locations uh, built into them and these are registers. Uh, and registers store data or instructions, could be either one, they are after all just a bunch of bits. Um, and registers are, as we know, a key concept uh, in CPUs and management of those is partly the role of the operating system. We've talked about registers in the sense of memory um, and you know, the general registers are you know, the ones that are we're thinking about when there's memory, but there are specific registers that are used for managing the state of the, the processor. Um, and so some of the registers that are interesting to talk about in a typical CPU, um, the program counter, this is, well, just keeping track of what instruction is next. Um, so after the instruction at this address has been fetched, the program counter is incremented and therefore it points to the next instruction, or at least our best guess at what the next instruction is going to be. As you know, programs typically have conditional statements um, and loops, so the next uh, instruction might not be the one that we think it is, uh, and that's fine, right? Uh, this is just sort of our best guess, uh, and if we are correct, hooray, uh, and if we're wrong, we will replace what we have with the correct one. No problem there. Um, status register. Um, this is also sometimes called program status word, PSW, um, and it's used as an array of bits to indicate flags or properties which maintain the state of the processor. And flags can be divided into two categories. There are the arithmetic and the non-arithmetic ones. Um, arithmetic flags are used to indicate mathematical outcomes, like if there was an integer overflow or if there was a division by zero. Um, that's noted by setting a flag in the arithmetic flags. Um, other things are used to note um, what mode the CPU is running in, you know, supervisor mode rather than user mode, uh, or to represent an invalid instruction. Uh, those sorts of things are managed in the status of the uh, CPU in the status register. Instruction register. The instruction most recently fetched will be stored in the instruction register. That's not actually that exciting, so not much to talk about. Stack pointer. Um, the CPU may have a specific uh, register to indicate the location in memory at the top of the stack. Uh, you will remember, I hope, that memory in an executing program is divided logically into the stack and the heap. Uh, and it's just convenient to maintain a handy reference to the top of the stack in memory. So if we ever need to allocate anything on the stack, we know exactly where to go. We just go there, we do it, and we don't have to hunt around to try to figure out where we should put it. Uh, and then the general purpose registers are the ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, these uh, store data as well as addresses and a typical uh, arithmetic instruction like addition requires usually data to be loaded into these general purpose registers and it stores the result in the general purpose registers and the data will eventually get moved out to main memory or wherever else it needs to go. 
uh, and that kind of thing is just sort of the normal part of executing the program. Usually the compiler is responsible for determining how they're used, but in C you can exercise at least some measure of control um, by using the register and volatile keywords, uh, which can be used to give a hint about what you want to actually happen. This is not an exhaustive list. There may be others in a system, the memory address register, the memory buffer register, IO address register, whatever hardware uh, your CPU comes with. You know, there might be some interesting things there um, that are beyond our discussion here. Um, we just want to get a flavor for what they could be, uh, recognizing that it's probably not an exhaustive list. Okay, um, and let's also talk about program execution. So, as I mentioned earlier, program is just a sequence of instructions telling the CPU what to do, um, and we can categorize those instructions as one of four things. Processor memory, so this is transferring data from a processor to memory or vice versa, so we're reading an integer from memory, um, or we are writing some data uh, out to memory. Um, processor I.O., transfer data to or from an I.O. device. This could be you know, make a speaker beep, or it could be you know, sending data over the network. Um, it could be you know, any other I.O. device. Um, we have data processing. This is performing an arithmetic or a logical operation. So we're adding two numbers or we're comparing two numbers. Um, these are you know, arithmetic and logical operations that we usually use to making a decision or you know, summing something up somehow. Uh, and then there's control. And control instructions just alter the sequence of execution. That is, go back to the start of the loop, uh, enter into a function, um, exit from something. Uh, all of those things are uh, control instructions by which we you know, you know, organize the execution of the program. Okay, interrupt. As I mentioned earlier, um, if I order the book from Library and Archives Canada, it potentially takes a long time for someone to walk the book to my office, uh, and I would spend a lot of time waiting, and I said in the meantime I would like to do something else. Um, and supposing that I do, all right, um, I'm in the middle of something else, uh, and I want to know when the book has arrived. So one option is polling. Um, and polling is I just check periodically if the book has arrived, and there's a certain amount of wasted effort in this, right? Um, every time I check, I put down what I'm doing, I go and you know, look in my mailbox, uh, and uh, all right, I don't see it, so okay, I guess it's not here. Uh, and then all right, I go back and I pick up what I was doing, and then I'm ready to continue. More efficient is I get an interrupt, uh, and that is I get a notification when the book is here. Somebody knocks on my door, uh, and until that happens, I don't have to stop what I'm doing. I don't have to check. I just wait, and you know, when it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't happen yet, well, wait longer, in the words of, of Ace Ventura. So that works, right? Um, in this analogy, I'm playing the part of the CPU, right? I've been interrupted, and I have to deal with the interruption. Um, we have the same in the computer system, um, and when there is an interruption, the normal sequencing of execution does not continue. Uh, we stop what we're doing, we deal with the interruption, and then we figure out what to do after that. Um, interrupts are also potentially categorized into four different um, buckets. Um, and just off the cuff, program. So something happens in the program, there's a division by zero, that results in an interrupt. Uh, it's handled a little bit like an exception might be in a language that, that has exceptions. So we need to stop what we're doing and we will address that. Um, we have timer interrupts. A configured timer within the uh, processor's um, time expires. So um, it's going to be, like if, if you look at the uh, system clock, you know, you're looking in the corner of the screen and you can see the, the time ticking, um, praying that this lecture will somehow end sooner. Right, um, every second you know, the timer fires and it says, hey, please update the clock. Um, input output, um, an I.O. controller signals a successful or unsuccessful completion of an operation. So if we did a read from disk and we were waiting for that read um, before something could continue, um, that results in an interrupt saying, okay, go, it's ready now. Um, and then last one, hardware failure. So if something happens in hardware, you know, the, the power goes out. Um, I was hard pressed for a little while to think of what I would um, what I would suggest for an example of this, but like the you know, the power failure one actually works 
pretty well. Um, because like if power goes out, your laptop switches to battery power and that sometimes triggers certain events, right? Like maybe the screen brightness goes down uh, because you're now on battery power. Um, maybe the um, CPU goes to a lower power mode so that uh, the battery life will be longer. Um, those things are triggered by the fact that, oh, hey, you know, the power is not working. Uh, and that's uh, used to trigger some events that happen in your software. Um, and so, yeah, interrupts are usually intended as a way to improve the processor utilization, that is to say the fraction of the time when the CPU is doing useful work. Um, CPU time is valuable and we can and should do something while we're waiting. Uh, and generally speaking, we would like to um, just handle the interrupt when it occurs and not before, right? Um, we issue a read to you know, get some data. Um, we work on something else will be interrupted when the data has arrived. It is possible to ignore it though, right? Um, you know, sometimes we would actually like to just ignore it because the interrupt doesn't contain anything that we care about. It's not important information, um, but almost always we wanna handle it and deal with it in some way. Uh, and you know, the analogy with which you are surely familiar is you know, a professor is at the front of the lecture hall droning on about some subject. A student raises her hand to ask a question um, and the professor can ignore this but that's generally a bad idea. This will be reflected poorly in his course evaluation. Um, what should happen is the professor should pause what he's doing. So stop talking, remember where he was, save the state somehow, take the question, answer it, handle the interrupt, uh, and then resume from where he left off, restore the saved state and continue execution. And the operating system is responsible for those steps. Um, so storing the state of the program, handle the interrupt, restoring the state of the program that was interrupted. Now the computer is a little better about this than a human would be, right? If I'm talking and somebody puts their hand up and they interrupt me, I'm just counting on the fact that I'm going to remember where I was, what I was talking about, um, but I'm not actually necessarily going to remember that correctly. What might actually happen is I forget and I have to ask somebody, sorry, you know, where were we before uh, I took that question? The CPU, however, uh, tries pretty hard to uh, write down where uh, in execution we are to make sure that we uh, can resume where we were. Um, so the operating system will store the state of whatever was executing at the time where the interrupt took place, uh, so writing it down, uh, handle the interrupt and restoring the state. Um, that's reliable, it's, you know, it's gonna work. Um, sometimes though, now is not a good time. And if that's the case, I mean, the CPU is in the middle of something where like an interruption would be bad. Interrupts can be disabled. Um, and disabled doesn't mean that no one can put up their hand. It just means we won't handle it until later. Um, and that's like the professor saying all the questions should be saved until the end of the lecture. More acceptable than saying, I'm just gonna ignore questions that you have. Um, but still probably not going to look too good uh, on my course evaluations at the end of the term if I do it. Um, but maybe saving it to the end of the lecture is sort of an extreme example. Maybe it's like I'll finish my sentence uh, and then I will handle the question. All right? Or I'll finish the paragraph or the slide or something before I handle it. So we've temporarily paused interrupts uh, and that will... Uh, compromise between you know, handling it and deferring it. Um, and yeah, all the questions uh, the students have saved can be answered eventually, of course, uh, and interrupts tend to have different priorities. So if multiple interrupts are pending, you know, there's more than one hand up at a time, the highest priority one will be dealt with first. Um, and I, I used to say uh, in this example, you know, if the queen attended one of my lectures, but I guess now I should say if the king attended one of my lectures um, and um, he or she, uh, he now I suppose, put his hand up uh, and had a question, I hope you would understand that I would choose to answer the king's question first um, because, well, he could say off with his head and people might be able to carry that out. So I think you can understand why that should have priority. But interrupts are usually handled sort of in, uh, in their priority sequence. 
Um, and interrupts could happen you know, not just concurrently, but you know, during one another. Um, so there might be sequential interrupt handling, which is shown on the left here, where um, an interrupt occurs and we have to do interrupt handler X, uh, followed by interrupt handler Y. Uh, or uh, we could have nested interrupt handling where we interrupt the interruption, so to speak. Uh, where interrupt handler X is interrupted in the middle to do interrupt handler Y, uh, and then we go back to X, and then uh, we resume the program. Answering questions in the lecture hall looks much more like sequential interrupt processing. I take your question, I finish uh, dealing with your question, even if somebody else puts their hand up during it, and then I take their question next. And that's usually what we would expect. But sometimes you know, interrupting the interruption uh, actually makes sense, uh, depending on what is sensible. Your system can also have a combination of things. If uh, say interrupt handler X is a higher priority, then we would make interrupt handler Y wait. Um, if interrupt handler Y is a higher priority, then maybe it interrupts uh, handler X mid execution. It's just a question of system design. So I said already that the operating system is responsible for storing the state of the program. Um, and uh, or the interrupt handler that's currently running when an interrupt occurs. And to do that, what we're talking about is remembering the state of the CPU. And what does that mean practically? You know, remember all the things. Well, state is the value of the registers in the CPU, the program counter, the instruction register, all of that. Um, and they gotta be stored somewhere. And our first idea would be, well, we can just put them on the stack. When the interrupt is finished, we pop the values off the stack, load them into the registers again, uh, and program execution can continue almost as if the interruption never occurred. So that would work. Uh, in the future, we'll see a different location for storing these kinds of things, but just for now, we have to remember, yeah, they, they gotta go somewhere, right? Where they go, We'll, um, we'll need to retrieve them, but it doesn't matter that much right now. And this, as I've explained it, of push it onto the stack and then restore it, it presumes that we are restoring the same program. Um, we don't actually have to do that. We could restore a different program if we wanted. Um, given that we've already stored the state of the program that was interrupted, it's already paused. We could you know, pick up something else instead. We're gonna talk about this in scheduling. Uh, in quite a bit more detail. So there's there's lots to talk about there. Um, and the fourth major element of the computer system, I.O., it is something we didn't talk about just yet because we've talked about the CPU and we've talked about the memory and we've talked about the bus, but we'll also talk about I.O. Uh, and there's three major strategies for communication. First one is programmed I.O., which is just a fancy way of saying polling. The processor issues an I.O. command and is responsible for checking when the I.O. operation is complete, usually by looking at a status register that belongs to the I.O. device or a designated memory location. The I.O. device updates the status register of the memory location when it's finished. Polling is a little bit inefficient, um, but it is a valid option. Um, the CPU is either waiting around doing nothing or checking the status register. Once the status indicates finished, then the CPU can take the data and do with it whatever it wishes. Then there's the interrupt driven I.O., which we've established is a bit more efficient uh, as opposed to polling. Um, and CPU issues a read or write, and when the operation is completed, the I.O. module issues an interrupt to indicate it's finished, at which point the CPU can take whatever data it was looking for and do something with it, like copy the data into memory. In both of these situations, the CPU is involved twice. It initiates the read or the write and then collects the result and does something with it. Uh, and the read has three parties, device, CPU, and memory. What if we could eliminate the middleman, the CPU, from this equation? And that's the third option, DMA, direct memory access. And this is the most efficient way to handle a large block of data. And all things being equal, it would be nice if we could choose DMA. Um, but CPU is just uh, delegating here, right? Uh, delegate you must or crazy you will go. Um, the CPU does some setup, so it sends data to the DMA module and says, you figure it out. Uh, and the CPU can go on with its life and not worry about um, handling the interrupt when it, when it comes in. 
Um, the CPU um, may have to contend with the DMA operation uh, to get the bus, but it's still more efficient than uh, either pulling or interrupts. Uh, and delegation just says, here's the operation to perform. Is it a read or a write? Uh, what's the source? What's the destination? And how much data is supposed to be transferred? Uh, and when that happens, um, the I.O. device can interact directly with memory uh, and make sure that uh, when we requested a read from, say, disk into memory, that everything takes place according to plan uh, without having to bug the CPU more than once.